This episode of Demystified is brought to you by Marmoset. Marmoset, together sounds better. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make your debut feature, submit now at studiofest.com. This series exists in both video and podcast form and is designed to be experienced either way. You can find the video version at moviemaker.com or the audio version wherever you get your podcasts. From Studio Fest and Movie Maker Magazine, this is Demystified, a series about an innovative new way to make movies and what it really takes to make an indie feature film. My name is Jake Bowen, and this series is about shedding light on the parts of getting an indie film made that are never seen and rarely talked about through the lens of Studio Fest, a one of a kind annual film festival that awards one writer and one director the chance to make their debut feature film. This is episode three of a bi monthly series, so if you're new to the show, you may want to catch up on episodes one and two first. All right, what does that email say? I'm like actually shaking right now. Last time, we left the American film market feeling much better informed, but more than a little uncertain about the prospects of finding distribution for the first Studio Fest movie, Souvenirs. Until... He said, let's set up the Skype. Would love to discuss worldwide routes. That sounds David Josh Lawrence, head acquisitions. He's the guy. He's the buyer. In case you don't recall, David Lawrence was the second person we interviewed at the American film market back in episode one. <laughs> oh my god! Do they want digital? Do they want It is like right, right out of the gate, worldwide rights. I, I don't know enough to know what that means. Like, well, it's global. I mean, it's... I mean, I know that part, but it's like, it, if someone's coming out of the gate right away for that, is it because they only see a certain kind of opportunity? Right, you know what I mean? Right. Like, I just, I don't care about making money, but I do care about getting our money back. Like, the numbers... Being able to pay investors their money back at the very least but that's a crazy email to just like look at and it's so short just relax relax i'm excited i'm excited there are two participants in the conference hello hi is that david (laughs) yes you've got uh david on the line and uh tom and a dog (laughs) (laughs) so yeah i watched the film yes we both watched it uh loved it great twist everything everything that we talked about in the interview you guys totally did you don't have names everything else has to be solid and tight and i thought that that was the case when i saw the trailer and i was pleasantly surprised to see that you guys followed all those directions way ahead of time so (laughs) you know what you're doing which means a lot of filmmakers are in good hands really 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 uh excited to uh talk to you guys about this Great. That's awesome to hear. Oh, that's so awesome to hear. I mean, not that we didn't know what we were doing at all, but to some degree we had no idea what we were doing, so I'm glad that... Tom and David start by asking what our goals are for the film. What we're hoping to do is recoup costs. Can you try to give me an idea of what the budget was? In kind budget is around 200k. Okay. When we're talking about uh, expectations, we're trying to be as clear and as transparent as possible about what films like this do, how well they do, and how much we can put into it without taking too much of a risk. It varies in how we want to attack it. Usually, our, our greatest sales come uh, around like uh, Berlin, Midcom, Can, and AS. Going to all those markets will reap the most amount of benefits. But if we want to domestically release it to as many platforms as possible, we could do that as well. You know, filmmakers have different things that they're looking for. And I think that you guys want more eyes on the project, I'd imagine, to kind of push your whole system forward, yeah? Since you're all filmmakers as well, if you were in our shoes, I guess, what sort of, what would you be looking for? So I would say now that it's new and it's, it hasn't been released, get it to market ASAP. You know? By the way, this is Tom Malloy, president of Glass House. We met him briefly in episode one as well. Yeah, but the key would be exposure and sales. Getting it to as many platforms as possible, as many outlets as possible, and seeing who will give us buyouts for that territory. Funny enough, our strongest market for this film will be AFM, and it's unfortunate that it's a year away. But that's the one where they're looking for American-based film. We have buyers and connections in every single territory that's out there. But as far as markets go, we have Berlin, Cannes, MIPCOM, AFN. Those are the okay. main ones for, the, for this film. And Toronto is just kind of like a pre-AFM mini market. Yeah, we're still sending things to our buyers that we met in AFM. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to be too hard to like hit them as well. Mm-hmm. We meet new buyers every single market. So the buyers that we met this market, we're definitely going to plug you guys in if that's what happens. Mm-hmm. And then when we come back to AFM, we'll probably meet another like 10 to 20 new buyers and we'll have mm-hmm. a whole new run. Mm-hmm. Do you have a sense? Jess wants to know if they have an idea of how this movie will perform based on similar movies they've sold in the past. We don't want to give you a number and then not hit that number. Sure. You know, but I will say that if you're looking at your budget for making money 
money back ratio without names. Over $200,000 is really hard to make with no names without a really, really strong, very specific genre. I will say, I think you may get close, but I can't promise any of that. So much depends on how the international buyers respond to it. And it might have a little edge because it does have more of a European feel than you know, other horror movies or thrillers. I think it would pass the censor board in China. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think there, there's anything like super offensive about it per se where it would prevent it from playing in the Middle East or Africa, which helps us. And, but I can't exactly say because it's always a question mark with the no cast. That's always the thing. That's why, as a rule, we don't do MGs or no cast because you never know. MG no stands for minimum guarantee. They don't do MGs for movies with no cast. While it's hard to compare your film to another film, because your film's very unique, the closest film that we have to it right now is Trauma Therapy, which was actually done for a smaller budget and has a few more notable casts. I am not here to lie to you or to cheerlead you. I'm here to change you. But Trauma Therapy is doing really, really well, and our buyers are really loving it. And if we rep you guys, it'll be real easy for us to go to those buyers and be like, hey, this is the same kind of energy, a completely different film, but same kind of vein. And I think that it'll do very well with all of our buyers that have already expressed a ton of interest in drama. It also depends how hard you push the film on your own as well, yeah. marketing-wise. We're also boutique enough that we have to sell everything we take, you know, else we wouldn't waste the time for anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So. Then the other part is your actors are all up and coming. They all have promising things coming up. Some people will catch a second wave. So your first year will be like, okay, and then your actors are taken off people are like oh what else did they do and you'll get second life i think you have like what three actors that are like on like, regular series and stuff like that exactly, like yeah. that, that's gonna get better and better I, I think you may even do better your second year than your first year so i think that there's a lot of potential for the film that uh, that answers your question a little bit uh, without giving you like a hard number uh, what's the lead girl's name i forget her name. Uh, isabella pisacane Isabella. Okay, yeah, now she's available to do interviews and things like that because we have journalists at Dread Central and Fangoria and uh, Rue Morgue and things like that. So she's available for interviews and things like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Totally, she'd be really into that. Uh, did anybody else while watching Isabella get a sense that like, she would be a great the daughter character in The Incredible? Oh, the girl that turns herself invisible? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, you won't be able to unwatch it when you watch her again. You'll be like, oh yeah. <laughs> I, I know that she's on her way. She's really good. How does it work with um, selling to international markets and then streaming platforms? I guess I, I'm not clear on the legality there. Would something mm-hmm. like that go up on like an Amazon, but then can you also still sell to markets? Yeah, yeah so there's there's something called geo-blocking where if it's on Amazon here, you can't get it on Amazon anywhere else, that kind of thing. The other thing is you know, when you sell to territories, all these other territories have their own specific platform that they will post it on. We sell the rights for them to bring it to whatever platforms they do internationally. But and just to answer your question as well, it does not ruin any international festivals. None of those are world platforms. That's just the U.S. releasing plan. Everything else we would be taking on a buyer-by-buyer basis. Usually we don't go to Amazon right away, especially not the subscription-based one. Uh, Basically, everybody who hears about your movie will be like, oh, is it on Netflix or is it on Amazon? And if it's on either of those that they're already paying for, they'll just go and watch it there, and you won't get any money from that because you you, you lose the transaction window. So yeah, Uh, you got to wait a little on Amazon. The Amazon Prime is an SVOD platform. SVOD means subscription video on demand. Like Netflix. Any of the ones that are yeah. FBOD. And we'll go to Netflix and Hulu and see if there's any plays there. But if you're talking about the transactional ones like Voodoo and iTunes, you kind of hit that first. Then you go to the subscription VOD platform. Then the third one is the ad-based one, which is 2B and Pluto and a couple of the other ones like that. Hearing it out is no problem. It's just getting people to notice it, you know. So what Tom's saying here is if you release the movie on all platforms right away, people will naturally seek it out on free or subscription platforms first, which means you're potentially undercutting sales from direct purchase platforms like iTunes and Vudu. And then here's one last question for you. If we got into a festival or something, that's... There's no conflicts there? It's that's, just, that's cool, right? Just, like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 100%. That's just more marketing for us. Unless <laughs> it's a festival that requires you not have distribution to be in it, which right. aren't very many. Like, if you don't have names, the next thing that we use to sell is laurels. It's like, oh, it won this festival, that festival. Mm-hmm. You put it all over the poster, and then buyers are like, oh, wow, okay, that's worth two minutes of my time time to watch the trailer so yeah any festivals that you go to it's not going to be a conflict of interest no, until the film's released but you know obviously we'll all be talking about that and if we're going to release it u.s and all those vod platforms then we'll know when it is and then sometimes festivals may have an issue with that if the film's already released 
some of them don't care. But the bottom line is, up to the point that it's released, it's definitely not a problem. It's just more PR for the film. For a movie like this, what typically would a, a deal look like from your end? You know, we do a 25-75% split, 75 going to you guys. And what about fees and upfront costs? After a full year of markets and delivery labor fees, the most that we see on films of this is like 15000 Most of the sales agents are in the 40 to 80 range as far as what they're recouping first. With a movie like this, we want to keep the fees as low as possible, so it's basically for every dollar you're getting 75 cents, we're getting 25 cents. That's it. And we're happy to fill you in on our knowledge of what specific distribution companies can do for you. Every once in a while, somebody will be like, oh, we got this offer from this distribution company, and be like, oh, wow, we'll go with them. <laughs> you know, like whatever best for the film we're going to do. All right. Well, thank you for uh, sitting down with us. We yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you, Beth. And thanks for an entertaining movie. You don't know how many we see where we don't have these calls. My eyeballs are bleeding after AFM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, cool. Thanks, All right. guys. Well, well, awesome. Great to talk to you. Yeah, okay, look for, I'll look forward to that email. All right. Sounds great. great. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things I like about where they're at we have another movie kind of like ours so it seems like there's a stream a co an easy conversation they can have with buyers right, but it sounded like 200 there's a chance you can get there but it sounds like their other film is the one that is getting there mm -hmm. is that right does that sound correct yeah sounded like it i and think they're, they're gonna work for it i kind of feel like we've got another one coming down the line we should just do it with this one we should just like align and mm -hmm. go forward <laughs> And then, like, if it's not a good experience, like, we have another movie coming in six months. Right. Someone else will yeah. we'll partner with, you know? I can't think of many reasons why it's a no, other than that there's something better that mm -hmm. we're going to miss out on if we do this. But I think they're all going to be the same, to be honest. I think you're casting a person. They're all going to go to the same five or six. Yeah. They all have a lot of the same contacts. And I liked Michelle. She's been going to Cannes for, like, 15 years, it said. I just think that it's not going to happen fast. I don't think it, we're going to make money in time for our next shoot, which is what I'm. my goal is, to have money in hand yeah. in order to shoot the next one. Because right. I don't know where this money for our next movie is coming from right now. You're paying someone to have connections you don't have. Yeah. You know? Could we do it ourselves? Probably. Do we need someone to do it for us anyway because we're too busy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we should just, you know, like enlist someone. The mood here might sound like disappointment, but I think it's simply the realization that finding a distributor isn't the finish line. It's yet another incremental step in the right direction that still has plenty of unknowns and no guarantees. More after the break. This episode of Demystified is brought to you by Marmoset. Marmoset is not a stock music site. It's a curated collection of real music by real musicians, bands, and record labels, often with entire albums available from a single musician or band. They have an award-winning music production team who collaborates with artists and bands to record original music, sound design, and custom scores. I used Marmoset while editing souvenirs, and one of the coolest features I found is the ability to sort tracks by their arc, a visual representation of the progression of the music. It's extremely useful and saves you a ton of time. Visit marmosetmusic.com to browse music now. Marmoset. Together sounds better. We've spent a lot of time so far in the distribution of the first Studio Fest film, but while all of this was going on, the winners of the second Studio Fest had already begun conceptualizing a new film. I think make she's going to be your more... Attitude, but your... I, I think my voice will come through in The Woman, because she's going to... Studio Fest 2019 took place in September, about three weeks before our trip to AFM, in Ojai, California. Over the course of the weekend, we held readings from the writer's screenplays and screenings of the director's short films in front of an audience which included the judges for the event. Filmmaker, festival organizer, and Sundance Institute fellow Andrew Houchins, award-winning director of Dear Lemon Lima and Unlovable Susie Younessi, Breaking Bad actor and film producer Michael Boffschiever, and Grease film and Broadway actress Jamie Donnelly. In the end, two winners were chosen, writer Luame Yasu and director Ryan Oxenberg. Born in Eritrea and raised in California, Luame Yasu is a writer, producer, and actress. Her screenplay submission, Who the Hell is Rich, is a comedy drama loosely based on her relationship with her father, with a tone and style reminiscent of Little Miss Sunshine. Ryan Oxenberg is a Canadian-born filmmaker whose multi-award winning short film submission, Together, is a psychologically complex take on the zombie genre. Blood is blood. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that I stop families from seeing it. Another thing that's really unique about Studio Fest is that you get to spend a weekend hanging out with like-minded writers and directors and actors and industry pros. There's a real sense of camaraderie and lasting connections that are formed. 
Justin Charles even optioned a script from one of the other finalists, Patrick Phelan, which I think is emblematic of the spirit of the festival and what it's aiming to do. There's opportunity even beyond the grand prize. Anyway, you'll be seeing and hearing a lot more from Ryan and Luam in future episodes. Do you prefer okay. David or Dave? I'll answer anything. Call me, call me, whatever you like. Just don't call me late for supper. Ah, okay. <laughs> when the folks at Movie Maker heard that there was a distribution offer, they put Justin Charles in touch with an entertainment lawyer who happens to be affiliated with the Slam Dance Film Festival. Pretty cool. We, we've gotten a, f- a contract from a distribution company called Glass House. We want to understand what kind of other things we should be looking for and what, what we should be wary of in these contracts. Yeah, so it looks like, they, I mean, they're relatively new. They position themselves as um, filmmakers themselves. So he was an actor turned distributor. Well, that's, 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 that's really neat. Is there any advance or no? Their form of an MG is in their first year, if they don't make you in this basic contract, it's $25,000 in year one, then they automatically don't re-sign. But if they make you more than that, then they have first dibs at re-signing you for two more years and so on every two years. That sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty fair. I like that. Yeah, like the rights come back to us. I like that. I I think that's true. They got one year to see if they can get you 25 grand. Sure. The only downside on that is they could sell the hell out of it and claim all these expenses and you get it back after a year, but they've already sold everything. So there's still a risk there with them. Let's take a look at the agreement. The trick is to maximize the revenue and count everything in revenue that should be and limit their expenses and try to monitor them and make sure that they're not taking more expenses than there should be. Right. And then if they do sell the hell out of it, you know, maybe 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 this one year deal is pretty good. We just but we have to take a look at the terms. The devils are in, in the detail. Stay tuned after the break for a preview of future episodes. Thanks to our sponsor, Marmoset. Marmoset is a full-service music agency representing a highly curated roster of diverse and rare artists, bands, record labels, and vintage recordings for music licensing. Visit marmosetmusic.com to browse music now. Marmoset, together sounds better. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make your debut feature, submit now at studiofest.com. Coming up in future episodes, lawyer David Pierce offers up some fascinating info about distribution contracts and recommends a bold counteroffer. Go from $10,000 to $140,000. That's insane, and these guys are probably never going to talk to us again. Also, we look at the challenges of collaboration on a feature between people who've never worked together before. And we address the elephant in the room, COVID. How do we continue to produce during a pandemic? Demystified is a Studio Fest production presented by Movie Maker. This episode was narrated and edited by me, Jake Bowen. It was conceived and recorded by Jess Jacklin, Charles Beale, and Jake Bowen. The theme song was composed by Patrick Patrikios. Additional tracks and music supervision were provided by Marmoset. You can find links in the show notes to some of the tracks used in this episode. To hear future episodes of Demystified, go to moviemaker.com or visit studiofest.com, where you can also learn more about Studio Fest and subscribe to the show.